Good evening, and welcome everybody to tonight's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Quentin Hardy. I'm the head of editorial at Google Cloud, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for tonight's program. Joining us is Dr. Dambisa Moyo, a leading global economist. Dr. Moyo is respected around the world for her unique insights and wealth of experience. She's also the author of a new book, Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It. In Edge of Chaos, she argues that liberal democracies are failing their own citizens. She emphasizes the importance of economic growth in creating global stability and presents us with a radical roadmap to reform our democracies to meet the needs of the people. We're excited she's here tonight to discuss this book with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dambi Samoyo to the Commonwealth Club. And I'm going to get straight to the interactive part of the program. I know we're going to ask you to like bring up some questions later, but let me just have a show of hands first. How many of you can name the three branches of American government? <laughs> Raise your hands. They laugh because it's so easy. I might call on one of you, but you know, for those of you who are shy, everyone, executive, legislative, and gold star. Now. Let's get a little perspective on that. Last August, the Annenberg Center did a survey. 33% of Americans could not name one of them, 27% could name one, 13% could name two, and a whopping 26%, about a quarter of the country, could name all three branches, one of the most basic elements of our country. 1% um, refused to do it, which I like to think of as, uh, my girl goes to a different high school, man, you wouldn't know her. <laughs> they didn't even want to admit they didn't know. So in other words, uh, for every four people you pass on the street, three people don't even understand their own system. That doesn't mean they don't have strong opinions about it, however. Um, now our guest tonight thinks this is part of a much larger problem. And in Edge of Chaos, she sets the stakes pretty high. Half the world's economies are at risk of social unrest. Ruling elites everywhere are increasingly corrupt. People feel they are perpetually in tenuous economic straits. Policies are in increasingly ineffectual and weak. And as the survey indicates, people are alienated from their own system to a point where they aren't even participating in, in it. And the system itself is failing them by not demanding it be regarded and thought about. Um, I guess I'd like to start with uh, the diagnosis. How did we get here? Well, first of all, thank you very much um, to the Commonwealth Club for hosting me this evening. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you for the audience here in the room, but also people who are listening um, on the radio. Um, the question about how we got here is absolutely critical, and the, the whole purpose of, of my book is to try and diagnose this problem, because this is something that hasn't just happened in the last couple of years. This is something that's been occurring over multiple decades. Um, you touched on uh, a number of reasons that we are concerned and why public policymakers and economists are talking about democracy around the world being under siege. But before I explain where I think the origin of these problems came from, I might perhaps just offer a few other data points for people to understand why there is this deep concern around liberal democracy in particular, but democracy more generally. Um, for one thing, voter participation rates are down. Um, the average voter participation rate today in the United States is approximately 50%. This is down from the mid to high 60s in the 1960s. And particularly more disturbing is that for households that are low income households and that earn about $30,000 per year, the, the participation rate is less than 30%. This is very far off from the one man, one vote mantra that's associated with the democratic process. A second problem which you alluded to is the issue about money having seeped into the political process. According to a New York Times uh, report a number of years ago, just 158 families in this country were responsible for 50% of the political contributions that were made during the US political presidential election in 2016. In addition to that, lobbying the amount of money going from lobbying has doubled um, in the past decades from around one and a half billion to over $3 billion today. Um, obviously, with the um, decision by the U US Supreme Court for Citizens United, um, this is further, I, I would argue, um, and through PACs and super PACs, does create a vulnerability where people feel that this money issue has become a, quite corrosive in the political process. 
There are a whole host of other issues. We won't go through all of them, but just to give you a bit more flavor, 80%, according to a Pew survey, 80% of Americans do not trust the federal government to do what is right on a regular basis. Um, according to a World Economic Forum report, um, citizens around the world, particularly in the emerging markets, trust authoritarian states more than they do democratic states to deliver economic progress. And of course, Freedom House, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., has been reporting um, about how over the last decade, the past 10 years, political freedoms around the world have been in, on the decline. Um, the rise of populism around the world, um, particularly in liberal democracies in Europe, is also something that is creating, uh, creating concern. So why is this happening? Um, and I would argue there are a whole host of factors. Um, for one, economic growth um, is, has remained uh, slow and is slowing. Um, according to an International Monetary Fund report in 2014, they argued that the rates of economic growth in, uh, that we saw before 2007 will never be seen again um, for a whole host of factors, um, which I call the economic headwinds in, in my book, and we can talk about those in a moment. Um, income inequality has widened, um, and a big impetus of that in, in the United States is that 50%, uh, we've seen a decline of 50% of social mobility um, over the last several decades. Deep concerns around the amount of debt that um, people as individuals are carrying, but virtually every class of debt in this country, household debt, government debt, student loan debt, um, and as well as credit card debt and auto loans, is now over a trillion dollars. And it, there are real concerns in a slow growth environment where interest rates are rising, how will we be able to pay that back? Um, finally, I'll just point out that there are other deep concerns around technology and the risk of a jobless underclass. Um, there's a report that came out from uh, Oxford's Martin School in 2013. They estimate that 47% of jobs in this country are at risk of disappearing because of automation by 2033. Of course, these are just forecasts, um, but from a perspective of public policymakers and for economists, um, we're particularly interested in making sure that we have risk mitigation uh, problem, uh, uh, scenarios and, and uh, uh, plans to make sure that the worst case scenarios do not emerge. So essentially, my, my lens is very narrow um, because I, I, I'm trained as an economist, and so my concerns are really about um, how economic erosion by many, uh, across many different groups, not just in this country, but around the world. Um, the skepticism around globalization's impact, I actually, uh, I'm a free marketeer and I am pro-democracy, just to be absolutely clear, but clearly there's a narrative that globalization has not lifted all boats, and in fact, there's a, a deep concern that there have been way too many losers, and um, I think we're suffering from that backlash, not just in the economics, but also in politics. Well, that was a rather thorough rundown, and where I... <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> wouldn't expect less. Um, what was illuminating for me was, in hearing it, I had framed the issue in a way as one of a kind of casual, willful, tongue-click ignorance. You know, you just said, those people, they're just, why, why won't they learn these things? But you're really talking about something much more troubling, which is despair. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that if there are pockets of, um, in this country, but around the world, I, I happen to be very fortunate. I've traveled to over 80 countries, um, and it's very clear. I should have actually said I was born in, in Zambia, um, born and raised in Zambia, one of the poorest countries in the world, and throughout my life, um, growing up in, in Africa, we were always told that the path to economic prosperity was through democracy and through market capitalism. Um, but over the last decade, having traveled to over 80 countries, um, clearly there is a concern of, around skepticism. People are no longer convinced. And the question is, why are we failing to convince people um, of the importance of democracy and, and market capitalism as a path for prosperity? And I, I think w the big point, and maybe the key takeaway here, is that deeply embedded in the political process of a democracy is myopia and short-termism. So our politicians very rationally 
court and cater to today's voters, um, and it's very easy for them to set aside the consequences of some of the policies and decisions that they're making today. The, essentially, we don't have to talk about the trade-offs um, of policy today with the, what, what, what the costs will look like for generations to come. So a classic example around that might be um, these, the issues around uh, a tax cut, for example. Um, today, that might be great for today's voter, but um, we know from the Congressional Budget Office there's a massive risk that debts and deficits in the next several decades will, will be looming and particularly more problematic for the United States but also for many countries around the world. So it's that myopia um, in public policy that has created a schism or a mismatch between all the long-term problems that I talked about, income inequality, demographics, debt, technology risks, et cetera, which are all long-term intergenerational problems that require a pragmatic and long-term perspective to solve, but we have policymakers who are very rational um, and, and very focused on, uh, on the, on the near-term, um, with elections in this country, of course, occurring every two years. So it's that mismatch that I'm trying to address in the book. And this gets to a very deep political promise that has existed for at least 100 years, possibly a little bit more, which is the, the winning appeal of the idea that we will work and our children will live better lives than we do, which historically is quite an anomaly. It's really a novel thing in the, in the long arc of history. People just were ruled and life went on in the same conditions. But there has come to be an expectation that your kids will have a better life, that things will be better. And this circles right to what you see as the heart of the crisis, which is, the absence of growth. Why is growth so important and why has it become so problematic? So if I may just um, offer a data point to show that there is this uh, d deep concern about uh, future generations and uh, picking up on this point about future generations doing better than preceding generations. According to an OECD report, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is basically a club of rich countries, um, they claim, uh, they've done studies, uh, the United States is a member of this group, they've done studies to say that this generation of Americans, for the first time in the history of the country, over 200 year history of the country, will be less educated than the preceding generation. The consequences, of course, for the workplace, um, but also for their ability to innovate and to participate in a, an economy that's becoming much more um, science-based, much more tech-based. Tech um, and I for think reactionary it, politics. Uh, absolutely, it becomes um, particularly concerning. To your question about why is growth important, there are essentially three things that I think are, are worth highlighting. I mean, one is just the basic sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, people's ability to satiate, uh, you know, roof over their head, uh, food on the table, uh, access to education and health care, uh, these are basic needs that growth can actually help to support and to fund. Um, a second issue that I think is important is about innovation. People's ability to think about innovation to solve some of the seemingly intractable problems that we're facing in the world from uh, climate change to concerns around, um, around health care, poverty, et cetera. I think those aspects can only be addressed by um, innovation and people's ability to think about, to sit back and think about innovation, I think is enhanced if they are able to solve, um, to solve some of their basic, uh, basic human needs. The third reason that uh, economic growth is important is that there's a wide literature that argues that you need to have a critical mass of a middle class in order to hold the government accountable. In order for democracies to function, you need to have a, uh, a large enough group of the population that is, uh, that is in the middle class. Um, and that comports with the participation rate argument that I made earlier that you know, it's not perhaps unsurprising that many people think that they're too poor or then minimum wage jobs, hourly wages, are not able to take time off to go and vote and, and participate in the electoral process. So I do think that um, uh, as we think about economic growth and its links to um, to this array of, of challenges, but more specifically in the context of the book, to co the concerns around democracy, um, we do need to think about how we're going to create economic growth. And a lot of the headwinds that I, I, I listed earlier 
are um, were catalytic for growth in previous decades, but they are becoming much more challenging um, as we think about economic growth and, and ultimately the survival of democracy. Well, what happened? Uh, we got a good lift from the Industrial Revolution, a tremendous lift from the managerial revolution in the way to organize large systems, um, a lift from the technology revolution. You know, um, in the ruins of Europe in 1945, they had a meeting, um, Britain and in Washington, had a meeting with the United States, and forecast it would take about 100 years to recover from World War II. They were astonished at how quickly it recovered and how good the growth was. And so we had that lift, and we've had new technology lifts. But why are we now at this state of exhaustion? What, what happened? Well, I think a, a large part of it um, is the, the fact that we've made, or pol public policymakers have made short-term decisions. So a classic example of this is something that Jack Ma from Alibaba talks about, the fact that the United States actually did benefit a lot from globalization. A lot of money was made by not just businesses, but also the government um, in terms of, uh, of, of tax revenue. But the question then becomes, well, what do they do with that money? And unfortunately, rather than invest in infrastructure, which today in the United States, according to the American Civil engineer societies ranked a D plus, um, and this is just not good enough for a modern society, but uh, the money was plowed into, um, into fighting wars, underwriting public goods around the world, which is, as somebody who lives, uh, who was born and raised outside of the United States, has greatly ap appreciated, but unfortunately that myopia um, may have sacrificed investments in education in this country, investments in infrastructure, which I think um, really have created this, uh, part or certainly contributed to the, the economic malaise we face today. Mm. And at the same time, there is a, uh, government has not invested long term, and it's become rather transactional with the voting base that does show up and does donate. That's, that's exactly right. To an extent, you'd find quite corrupt. Well, you know, I think I I'm, I I can't remember putting saying that they're corrupt. I know you've mentioned that. I, I think I'm, you're hang, you're hanging me out there a little bit. I mean, I haven't actually. Okay, said my that. word, not yours. <laughs> yeah, it's your word. Money actually. is a form of Just speech. <laughs> it, 160 families dominate, but it's not corrupt. It's not. I don't. Well, you know, to me, the definition of corruption is is there's something there's illegality around it. I oh mean, no, I just meant a kind of corrosion of the system. Oh, well, that's a different word. Corrosion is different from corrupt. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> anyway, we get the point. The point is that it's. Uh, I think we either can, way, we can, it's broken. We can agree that um, it's uh, it's unsatisfactory, and you know, I think it's worth just stating we we need the United States to function at a high level. And I say we. I'm just going to speak on behalf of eight billion people in the world um, because we need the investments in in, in R and D, in science, and technology, in and we need the United States to take a lead in on issues of desalination. I mean. 70% um, of the earth is water, but 97% of the water is, is too salty for use. Um, there are real concerns around the middle class in this country eroding. And there's a fantastic study by a professor at NYU, Przeworski, um, who has this model that predicts how long democracy can last based on per capita incomes. So his argument is that at low levels of per capita income, democracy doesn't last that long because there's so many factions and so much populism. But we're s And we're seeing that already in Europe. And I, I, don't, I, I really want um, essentially the arguments here to, to motivate people to strengthen the democratic process here, but also to really to help us find long-term solutions to this whole list of challenges uh, that we face. I, yes, I, I think in a very deep sense, you're actually quite optimistic. Absolutely, because deeply so. Because you feel it can be changed and you feel the cynicism has been part of the problem. I mean, clearly the idea that government can't do anything and that, to you know, Ronald Reagan's line, the worst words are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, is just wrong and it breeds a kind of cynicism about what government can be. Now at the risk of getting you in trouble with your friends at the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, do you think government can be a force for good and should be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I'm not a big bureaucrat, but um, at the same time, I think it's a resolved question about what the important role of government plays if mm -hmm. it's functioning correctly. Um, we need government to set public policy so that businesses know what the, the landscape is to in invest, create jobs, build communities, support But um, also invest in things like basic research. 
scientific. A absolutely, basis. innovation, research, etc. Yeah. And public um, education. But, but more than that, it's about the, the range of public goods. It's education, it's about national security, it's about infrastructure, it's about healthcare. I know healthcare in this country is not really considered a public good, but in other places in the world, <laughs> we need the government to deliver mm -hmm. um, those type of outcomes. And you know, the most efficient governments do it very well. And then governments, I, I fear, that become very short term, do get challenged by these trade-offs where they think, well, let's not invest in infrastructure. Um, will invest in, in something else that is uh, short-term appealing and actually can, you know, as I said, very very rationally help uh, e get me reelected if I'm a, a public official. It's an enormous challenge to turn around cynicism, though, isn't it? Well, it is, but for God's sake, this itself. is America. I mean, I know. this country <laughs> is, is built on innovating. I mean, uh, the reason everybody, uh, well, not, maybe not everybody, I'm beginning to sound like people who exaggerate, but um, the reason people want to come to this country is because this is a country that is c constantly checking itself, um, you know, deciding things aren't working and refocusing. I mean, people around the world look to the United States because it's fantastic at recognizing when it's going the, down the wrong path. And look, the reality is, just go back in history. There were 150 years ago, somebody had the cockamamie idea that women should vote. Um, and at that time, can you imagine, people must have been rolling their eyes saying, what's wrong with you? Um, you know, the civil rights movement, this country is known for checking itself. And so I'm extremely optimistic. I'm, I'm not presenting this uh, discussion in, in many other countries because I don't think those countries are able to innovate or as flexible in terms of their thinking as they are in the United States. And so I, I do believe that even the government can actually um, innovate, and I think it has in the past. Mm -hmm. As a public policy specialist and an economic historian, you seek parallels. Are we at a, a time similar to this? I mean, uh, can you find times that are similar to this? Well, I, I think that the, the the short answer is is no, um, and I, I alluded to this already. The the headwinds that um, I listed out earlier, and just as a quick reminder, you know, issues around technology and the jobless underclass and widening income inequality, declines in productivity, so the rate of output per per unit worker, the amounts of debt, these are all at historically um, levels that have never been seen before. And um, it, you know, one of my favorite uh, um, sort of uh, factors that and headwinds is, is around demographics. You know, we're about eight, almost eight billion people on the planet today. It took 125 years to go from one billion people to two billion people. It's taken 50 years to go from three billion to nearly eight billion. Um, the speed with which the world's population is growing is something that's never been seen in history or prehistory and will never be seen again um, uh, once the world's population plateaus out at uh, 21, in 2100 at 11 billion. I mean, India's adding a million people a month to its population. I mean, a million people a month. Um, these are unprecedented levels of uh, population growth. In, in Africa, my home con continent will represent 40% um, of the world's population um, by 2070. I mean, these are inc incredibly uh, enormous uh, uh, changes to the world's population. These that are wonderful things, seen. by the way. They, they, better they child be, health. They should be better wonderful. maternal nutrition. Yeah, and there have been there has been progress. You know, you know to the global life expectancy average today is seventy one years old. I mean, think this about that. This is why you have moment. such a rich population. Yeah, but it does create challenges. It, it certainly does because at the same time um, we know that uh, the the, the um, right mounting costs of uh, social security, um, pensions, etc. is are, are things we have to grapple with. But also we've got you know according to the International Labour Organization we've got a hundred million young people who are what they describe as needs, no education, employment, and training. Um, so, you know, in a world that's becoming perhaps less dependent on labor, uh, how do we manage that so people don't end up getting into, into bad, bad, uh, mm. bad games? Mm. That's a very deep question because for very good reasons, work and identity, a sense of self-worth are completely intertwined. Absolutely. You'd have to yeah. really restructure society to move away from that. Exactly. But I mentioned in the green room, um, what makes you confident this isn't just the 70s in a replay when there was the Club of Rome and limits to growth and we'd be in permanent slow growth and we were in the stagflation environment where there was a certain kind of you know incipient despair yeah. But then we turned a corner very quickly. Yeah, and that's a great question because with issues around national resource scarcity, for example, we've heard 1798, um, Malthus right. made, made the comment. Um, as you say, the Club of Rome in the 1970s, and it's true, we were bailed out 
um, by technology um, in, in, that, uh, in those times. And so it may very well be the case that, that we're all we're, we're fine. But you know, I've just listed for you some very unique aspects to the, the, debt the level growth is, picture. Is debt, is, debt, is, debt is unprecedented. The population growth is unprecedented. Income inequality is going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so, th th which, by the way, there's a, a fantastic book, which I urge you to buy after you bought my book, um, <laughs> <laughs> by Walter Scheidel, who's actually um, here at Stanford, a book called The Great Leveler. It's a very thick book. Um, it requires a lot of alcohol to think to get through it. But um, what he's done is he's looked over 2,000 years at episodes of income inequality, and his conclusion is that pub public policy has not been able to solve those problems um, uh, income of income inequality. We've had to resort, in fact, unfortunately, social mobility, social unrest um, and revolutions um, were sort of the response to, to that. So I hope he's wrong, but um, it, does, uh, it does really um, sort of wake you up to, to think about that. I, uh, I want to turn to the solutions that you... Um, suggest, but first I'll pay some attention to this healthy inventory of questions we have from the audience. Um, first question, can you comment on what role impact investing and social entrepreneurship should play on the global stage? Does the old way of business, doing business need to die for something new to be born? And this touches again on something um, we touched on back, backstage, which is large transnational organizations and accountability. Yeah, so I think that um, I'm, again, quite optimistic. I mean, what's really important for us to remember is approximately 80% of, uh, of the workforce is actually involved uh, in, uh, in small business, small medium businesses. Small medium businesses are the backbone of economies. And so impact investing, um, you know, at, at a micro level is critically important, but it's probably worth just saying that very large corporations have already changed their mandate and they continue to evolve. So maybe 20 years ago, the mandate would be very purely maximize shareholder value, full stop. Today, mm -hmm. it's maximize shareholder value, but also be a good citizen. Think about issues around income inequality within companies, but also more generally in the communities in which we serve. Um, think about uh, um, the environment. Think about uh, aspects of, of education, You're trying to, to assist. And, and these are areas that have largely, traditionally been in the purview of government, but now I think the best companies and the companies that will survive the 21st century and beyond are companies that naturally understand that they have to participate in, in, a, in a broader broader mandate. Yes, they seem to, um, and this in some ways touches on my world of technology, they operate in a larger ecosystem of awareness. People are aware of what they touch and what their supply chains are like. They are aware of responsibilities as a consequence of their actions in a way that corporations didn't have before. Yeah, which is probably a good thing. Well, it's, an, it's a natural evolution of, um, uh, particularly in a world where uh, it's an artifact of technology. I mean, people do have more information. Um, you know, I, I'm not particularly stunned by it because you can imagine the advent of television um, and being able to see uh, what's going on in the rest of the world. And that ha most certainly had an impact of, on foreign policy and, and engagement. And so uh, I think this is just a natural um, path for businesses, but also other forms of institutions, civil society and government. If you want to compete, I think we need to be much more broad-minded about getting information on how other businesses but other countries are performing and how what they're doing right that, that seems to be working. Well, it may be surprising. You mentioned Maslow, and um, it is a very Maslowian aspect to modern consumption that a company's overall impact matters. You don't enjoy consuming from a company that is appeared to have a, a bad impact, that has a, a bad feeling about itself. Yeah, and well, that didn't used to be an issue for these guys. Well, I don't know. I, I, mean, I, can't, I wouldn't go so s strong as to say it wasn't an issue. I mean, I think that um, companies, maybe some that don't even exist today, were, may have been subjected to different forms of um, of attack and, uh, and, and question. I, I think that, that that is just, to me, a, a natural sign of a, a company doing good business um, constantly checks itself. And, and, and we just happen to live in a world where we might be more hyper-tuned to it because of social media. But I, as I said, I think the, the advent of the radio, the advent of television, I'm sure, brought to the fore um, the way different companies and, and institutions worked. Another question. Do you think guaranteed income can work financially and psychologically? 
Um, that's a great question. So um, just to highlight a little bit more this puzzle of income inequality, when I was doing my PhD, nobody talked about income inequality because we assumed if you create economic growth, then um, we'd be able to pay wages and through wages and through um, investments, um, we would be able to, to improve people's lot and therefore you'd see income inequality um, decrease. Uh, we, one of the, the biggest puzzles right now um, is that income inequality is on the top three, I would argue, most important public policy issues. And the, the problem is that we've tried the extreme ways of solving income inequality and, and neither of them have really worked to, to stem this, this tide of widening, uh, widening income inequality. We've tried left-leaning policies, more favored by the Democrats, tax and spend, very f popular in Europe, but income inequalities continue to widen. We've also tried more right-leaning, right sort of a trickle-down economics types of policies um, where you keep taxes low um, with the, the hope that companies and businesses would hire more people and increase wages, um, but that has also not helped to stem the, the tide. And so there is this question, uh, what, what can we do? And I think that universal basic income really basically falls into the tax and spend uh, types of proposals. I don't think that they're bad, but I don't think that they're enough um, for the reason you pointed out earlier, that people want more than just a Band-Aid solution. Um, they, they do want to participate. They want to engage. They, they seek want meaning. To improve. They seek meaning. And Stephen Hawking, who just um, passed away not too long ago, he, d he described that work is not just to earn an income. It's about participating in community. It's about innovation. And I think that these types of Band-Aid solutions, although can be quite appealing in the short term, I think over the long term there are real issues that we should be investing in. Education, which is multi-generational, takes a lot of time um, to see the benefits. People get frustrated. It's not very sexy to say, let's invest in education. Um, but that, to me, is a, is a type of longer-term investment that I'd love to see more of, um, in addition to these type of Band-Aid band solutions. No, it, this touches on something very deep in human nature that I don't think we're going to change. You, you go back into a cave 20,000 years old and a caveman has put his handprint on the wall. Graffiti is, goes back to the Roman era. Um, people want to leave a mark. People want to get a sense they made some impression on the world before they pass on. And if they're simply paid to exist, you're going to have a social crisis. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's, that's absolutely right. I agree with that. So, um, this is a good question. As the U.S. government is in major gridlock, how is it that the economy seems so strong? And to tweak that just a little bit, stock market breaks all these records until about January, but it's still strong. Unemployment's nominally at 4%. There are good numbers in this economy. Yeah, and I think that, that is, you know, I'm tactically very, meaning short in the short term, I think that there are a lot of reasons for us to feel like there has been progress made. Um, you, the unemployment number you've, you've touched on, there have been improvements there. Uh, we have seen the stock market, you've also mentioned the GDP numbers. So yes, this year I think it's, we can remain pretty constructive. Um, I think a lot of that, though, is based on um, massive government intervention on the back of the financial crisis. Um, we know about quantitative easing. We know how much money the government has plowed into the economy. Um, but it doesn't. It does, I think, still mask some of the distributive effects. I mean, how many people are really benefiting from the increases in the stock market, for example? Um, and there are other areas that might um, be masked as well. Well, um, this is the, the, the bookend of the first question. Oh, right, Comment on the impact of our trillions of dollars in debt on our growth and prosperity aspects. So I think that's we are borrowing to create a, yeah, a great absolutely. deal of Absolutely. And look, you don't have to listen to me. Go and look what, at what the Congressional Budget Office, so the U.S. government's Congressional Budget Office is saying about debts and deficits uh, in the years to come. Um, you know, obviously the perennial question now is where is inflation? Nobody seems to know why we're, we're not suffering from those, those issues. But interest rates are going up. Um, you know, how, how, do we, how does the economy survive? And I, I, I don't, I'm not in any way suggesting that we can't come up with uh, tools to try and address uh, or to uh, avoid appending the global economy, but I think the, 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 the solutions are long-term. Um, and uh, the more we're seduced by short-term policy interventions, I think the bigger risks um, that we face. Mm -hmm. uh, we have several questions um, about Africa, mm -hmm. probably, you know, Germain, with your first book and what you're thinking about now, uh, what should America's plan and policy towards Africa be? How should we interact with governments, people, and cultures there? 
Wow, what a great It's question. a big continent. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I've already spoken on behalf of 8 billion people, so, so. It's just, this, is, <laughs> this is nothing. We're skinnying it down a little bit here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, good. So um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this topic because my, my first book actually is, will be 10 years in January, and I've been thinking a lot about what has happened in that 10 years. Um, for those who don't know, the ten, my, my first book was really a critique of, of um, the aid approach, which really picks up on something I said earlier. I think that the aid approach is, is helpful in, in the short term as a Band-Aid solution, but it was never going to create economic growth or the, the sort of 7% um, per year that we need in order to double per capita incomes in a generation. So this was not something that's going to be sustainable. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about now is that um, we do need the world to engage in Africa, um, if not for opportunity, certainly for risk mitigation. Um, as I said, if the population of Africa is trending towards half of the world's population, certainly over 40% by 2070, um, you know, the, 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 con the contribution of, uh, of um, disorderly migration into Europe concerns around um, Ebola. I was just watching today, there's another Ebola outbreak on the continent. And you know, if you listen to the CDC, um, the, the uh, Center for Disease Control in this country, the rise of, uh, of diseases, um, communicable diseases like Zika and Ebola is on the rise. In fact, there's a, another fantastic book is by um, the chief medical officer in England. Her, her book is called The Drugs Don't Work. We're becoming resistant to a lot of drugs. Um, we've got 70 million uh, refugees in the world today, the highest number of refugees on record ever. Uh, um, some people say maybe since, 20, since the uh, World War II, but certainly uh, Africa's contributing to a lot of, of refugees. So so the combination of low economic growth, um, disease burden, uh, um, issues around um, environment, but also um, I would take some concerns around terrorist cells, which are, are breeding uh, across the continent. I think we have to be much more vigilant about how we get involved there, um, especially since the population it, it will be enormous. Mm -hmm. um, this question has to do with corruption. Do you feel Africans have discussed corruption ad nauseum and need to get over it and move on. I'm not sure one gets over I corruption. I don't know what moving on means. Yeah, <laughs> but um, is, is there something unique in the state systems there that makes them dysfunctional more frequently than in other places? Yeah, I mean, I think it's lack of accountability. It's not all countries. I think that uh, there are many countries where the... Um, the uh, public purse is essentially funded by the aid regime. Um, and there's a sense that government, I mean, so actually in a perverse sense that um, a head of state said to me, uh, actually the more poverty and disease you can show, the more aid you get. Um, and actually there's no challenge as to really where that money's been spent, how it's been spent. Um, I, you know, I'm in no way saying that nobody should support um, you know, Africa and Africans, but what I am saying is I think that we should hold those governments to the same standards that we'd hold our own governments. Right, somebody um, made so this that's a problem. point to me about philanthropy in this country and how difficult it was to fund because the best people solve problems and that means they're out of a job. Right. And so exactly. it, it, it's not the disincentive, it's just the, the strange nature of what success means in this. Right. And you have to find them at the end when they've solved it and reward them with a new problem to solve. But I think one of the other things that I, I just stumbled on not too long ago is something that Michael Bloomberg said, um, the three-time mayor of New York. He said, the most efficient governments are governments that where there's no corruption, they're forward-leaning, they're data-driven, and they focus on measured outcomes. And it seems quite simple, you know, four tenets, but I kind of like that, that, mm -hmm. you know, if you actually... Uh, imbue that those things in the uh, in the system. I think that you're likely to get better outcomes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to group a, a question here. There's one about uh, growth and democracy. Why do we feel that you feel that growth and democracy are clearly so important? Are there other <laughs> methods or means we might address or think about? So yeah, I, I am open to the um, the sort of uh, question as to whether the uh, growth focus is really the only path for human progress. In fact, Simon Kuznets, who was a Russian-American um, many uh, decades ago, who actually came up with the GDP estimates, um, he said, well, basically, when it all comes down to it, there are only four countries, underdeveloped, developed, Japan, and Argentina. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he said that, um, and it, it's, I, I find it just as funny as you do, because um, he said, you know, 
with the problem with Japan is it's gone from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being one of the richest countries in the world, and nobody knows how they did that. And Argentina, at the turn of last century, was in the top 10 wealthiest countries in the world, and now it slid down to being one of the most impoverished in South America. And nobody knows how that's happened either. And so I think that, you know, I, I'm, I tried try not to be ideological about anything. Um, and so I wouldn't sit here and say it absolutely is the case that um, growth as it's been defined is the only path to, um, to uh, democracy. Um, but I would say that um, for the reasons I outlined earlier in terms of Przeworski's work and, and this idea of a middle class that's able to hold the government to account, uh, I would say that there, it's, there's more compelling evidence now that, uh, de that economics is actually the prerequisite for democracy as opposed to democracy being a prerequisite for economic growth. And I think China's a, a good example of that. I wouldn't put myself forward as an expert, but I did spend six years in Japan with the Wall Street Journal. And one is struck there by the level of sacrifice short-term for long-term benefit mm -hmm. that was stitched into the economic recovery after the war. Right. The things people forewent and the extent to which they labored to deliver longer term growth, deep investment. Yeah, but that was very it's exactly much, what you're talking about. But it's about also very much, it was part of the American culture. I mean, the United States, American citizens sacrificed a heck of a lot um, I I during the Marshall Plan. It wasn't obvious what the benefits were to them, to, for them at that time. But mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I, I just don't want to make it seem like Americans are, are only short term. I think this idea of uh, short termism has become more part of society today. I mean, we see it with um, hedge funds and portfolio uh, the, uh, the sort of length of time they hold stocks in portfolios, we see it in CEO tenures, we see it in you know myopia in the political process, but you know Americans have made enormous sacrifices for the world, um, and and they continue to do so. They are the biggest underwriter at NAT in NATO. You know many countries rely on the United States to police the sea lanes, but you know I think there are some trade offs that need to be made for you know having the United States actually uh, working at at a, a very high level in order to continue to to support those initiatives mm. and so mm. I, I you know I think it's worth making that point now in the midst of this in this period of I use the word despair doubt <laughs> however you want to put it um, we do see a rise in protectionism and nativism authoritarianism um, authoritarian capitalism in the case of China is one euphemism um, do you regard these as alternative methods that will stay? Do you regard these as um, short-term responses to a kind of crisis? How do you view so the let current me, political um, climate? Let me separate the, the, the question. So let's deal first with the, uh, the question of protectionism. Um, I don't like the idea of protectionism. In fact, I, I think I mentioned already I'm a, a supporter of free markets. Um, however, I think that it's, it's clear that free markets in their pure form from a sort of economic, canonical models of economics or textbooks doesn't actually exist for very good reasons, which we, we know that politics politicians have to protect their own citizens. But I will say that we already know the consequences of, uh, of tariffs um, and protectionism are long-term damaging. Just look at what happened in the, the years after the Great Depression, 1929, in this country, when um, Smoot-Hawley tariffs, there were 3,200 tariffs that were placed on goods for import into this country. Um, most historians and economists agree that that approach definitely extended the period for recovery. It took much longer for the United States to recover um, economically, but also the, uh, the, it, it definitely contributed to higher unemployment rates um, into the 1940s, and it certainly um, created a slowdown in economic growth. So it's pretty clear that that is an example of how short-term uh, protectionism looks quite appealing, but longer term, I think it's, uh, it's quite damaging. But your other question um, regarding authoritarianism, I think actually opens up a more fundamental question around ideology and um, just fundamental differences uh, between Western thinking, Western thought, the idea of democracy and uh, liberalism versus what we'll call for shorthand the China model. And what I will say is that in this country and in Western Europe, um, the individual is, is held as sacrosanct. The most important entity is the individual. And frankly, whatever the individual wants to do is totally fine as long as it doesn't impinge on the behavior of somebody else. 
Um, that's very different from the Chinese model. For the Chinese model, the most important thing is society and community. And in fact, they're quite skeptical of human beings because they say, well, these human beings are not to be trusted. They do bad things to themselves. Um, they probably eat too much, drink too much, and they know that they're doing those bad things. So the role of government and the political class is to control that behavior so that they don't completely sink the whole society. Um, I think, I believe the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. I mean, I, I think when you speak to the Chinese people about ideology, they say the only thing they're ideological about is economic growth. So if we were able to convince them that the combination of democracy and market capitalism could deliver um, equitable growth in a sustained way, they would pick it, they would adopt it tomorrow. They just don't believe that that's the case. But there, the one last point I would make is that in the context of Western society, it is the case that there are enormous costs, societal costs, that we as individuals are imposing on the system. Um, you know, I can, I can potentially have as many children as I like um, without any restrictions. I can eat as much as I like. I can uh, drink as much as I like. I can behave recklessly. And all of those things do potentially impose costs on society, but we're not very good in Western uh, society at ascribing those costs. Whereas in China, uh, not only do they ascribe the costs, but they also trade the costs. And I'll conclude by just telling you really quickly that one of the initiatives that um, th has been rolled out in China is something called sesame credits, um, where basically uh, citizens are rewarded for doing things that are good for society as a whole. So if I take my nephews and niece to play soccer at the weekend, that's a good thing because they're learning teamwork, they're getting some exercise, that's a good thing for society. So the Chinese political class will say, well, that Dumbisa is really right. great. We'll give this you VIP of, tickets it's to their Black version Panther. of Twitter likes only at your <laughs> life. Yes. <laughs> And you know that that's completely antithetical to Western society. I mean, it would never happen here because mm -hmm. people say, "What about my privacy issues?" It flies in the face of First Amendment. And They're applauding your quality as a citizen. Absolutely, and so, um, but that is how they think about things. And and I think that it's in interesting for us to at least appreciate that they just happen to have a very different model um, as to uh, and how they approach these economic challenges. Now, in something like a Brexit or the recent Hungarian election or the um, our president's view of uh, fewer uh, multilateral treaties and more direct engagements. Um, what's going on? What, what is this search for certainty people have by being more nativist and more, you know, my country first? Well, I think it's, I, frankly, I think it's uh, expedient. Um, you know, we do like to, uh, as human beings, blame somebody for our, our lot. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I am very sympathetic to the challenges in middle America um, and many places around the world. People have lost jobs, they've lost ho homes, they've lost opportunities. Um, they don't see a way forward. And I think rather than pick at them or sort of uh, speak to them in a sort of pejorative way, I think we need to understand that we have made some mistakes um, and hopefully we can remedy them because I think the whole host of challenges that the global economy faces and the world faces cannot be solved on a unilateral basis. We do need everybody um, at the table to discuss these challenges. So I, I very much hope that there'll be more engagement. I am turning towards solutions now. Oh, great. And I'll, I'll begin with this uh, a last uh, audience question which I'll pick up the others later. Uh, it's this one, uh, an audience member asks, it seems like the U.S. economy is designed to keep low, middle, and even upper middle income households in a precarious state with worries about job loss and health problems, the kind of disaster that a major health issue can be for people. Living with that economic fear causes people and the politicians to think short term. How do we give vast numbers of people security to break this cycle? Well, so... It, it does. This is kind of a, a good segue into the solutions. Um, I have a lot of faith in the political process, and and we, we're already seeing that in the individual citizens in this country have a lot of influence in changing, you know, gun control, the debate on gun control. They are able to um, influence corporate behavior, and so to my mind, they are able to um, really. Uh, take up arms and, and solve some of these uh, issues around the political system and, and where it's failing in terms of short-termism, in terms of money. Um, I, I think, I alluded to this earlier, I think that there's a history in this country of uh, people feeling that things are unsatisfactory. And even if there is a legal framework that says this is okay, 
there, if, but if in the face of people questioning the moral and ethical challenges of it, I think people are inclined and have been shown to take up arms and to say, you know what, this is not acceptable. And that maybe has even forced the, the legal issues um, to reform. So in a nutshell, I think there are a lot of challenges. I think people, perhaps their understanding of what the origins of those challenges needs to be changed, as I gave the example of globalization. I think that um, globalization in of itself is not a bad thing. It's getting a bad rap because uh, our politicians um, not all of them, but many of them are very short-term in their thinking, and they have made decisions that have not helped us. So we need to we need to focus on that rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater and decide we want to be protectionists, because historically we know that that ends up in a bad bad place. Let's move to the solutions uh, directly. There are there are ten here. We can go down them a step at a time. I did write in the margin um, that you may have affected. Uh, a real bipartisan moment in America because both existing sides could hate this. <laughs> <laughs> then my job here is done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, shall we just walk straight uh, through them? They're, it's a significant. Why don't I introduce them? There you go. I'm a bit I think suspicious that's of your um, your language. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. just as a little preamble. I thought we were getting along okay <laughs> here. <laughs> Um, there are 10 proposals. Uh, I, I want to just make a, a few points. Uh, first of all, six of them are targeting politicians and where I think we can improve uh, politicians' behavior. Four of them are targeting voters. Um, but the, this, the way this, um, the, the book is structured, we're not supposed to sort of accept these proposals wholesale. Countries are at very different forms and levels of democracy, different structures of democracy. So this is supposed to be sort of a menu. You pick and choose and think about how you might improve uh, democracy. I just also want to say before we talk about some of them, because I, I'm sure in this room people will think, oh my God, that's, this woman's completely crazy. <laughs> um, I just want to, you to know that all 10 of them have precedent somewhere in the world. So somewhere in the world, these proposals um, are working um, in some, some respects. And so worth keeping in mind, and, and as much as possible, I'll give you some examples of uh, where these things are working in different countries. So would you like to speak to them? Sure. I so tremble. I will, not go, I will not give you all of them, because then you won't buy the book, um, but I will give you a few of them. So on the politician side, I talk about, um, one thing I talk about is uh, pay, increasing pay, increasing the pay of politicians, but also forcing them to justify their uh, compensation. And the, the model I, I talk about here is Singapore. In Singapore, um, the prime minister is the highest paid in the world. He gets about $1.7 million a year. Um, but the ministers who are responsible for infrastructure, education, healthcare, they all get um, 30 to 40% bonuses at the end of the year if they meet performance indicators, so life expectancy increases, GDP increases, inflation's low, et cetera, unemployment improves. Um, but the other thing that's quite clever is that, um, from what I understand, they have clawbacks. So in 10 years' time, if they find out, actually, you know what, that wasn't real GDP growth, they were just inflating the numbers and forcing us into get more debt, they'll be able, they, the government will be able to take the money back through the pensions of the politicians. Um, a lot of that type of innovation, uh, it, it happens in other countries as well. They call them, they're essentially performance contracts on the politicians. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's already happened in the private sector. Um, I think many people who work in, in corporations have some kind of performance mm. uh, um, compensation where they, you're rewarded for good behavior or performance and you're punished for bad performance. And so I think we should be open-minded about, about that. But so many of our congressmen are millionaires to begin with. Well, and you know, I, but that doesn't mean that we should compensate them without really understanding where the value add yeah, is. I think that there's something about performance um, that I think is quite appealing. Without giving too much away, I think we should turn to at least one area, which is um, the whole structure of voting and how you yeah. think it ought to be revamped. Yeah. Let's talk so about again, that a just bit. Well, I just want to be um, clear on the language. Uh, it's not how I think it should be revamped. It's, uh, these are questions for consideration. I think we should think about uh, evolving and, and improving uh, democracy. So um, one of the proposals is to consider mandatory voting. If we think about uh, the sort of democratic utopia as having as many people as possible voting, but also having um, the, 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 the voter's knowledge base uh, be at a certain level, uh, I think that those are those two very uh, important goals. Uh, mandatory voting is something that we would consider certainly in terms of increasing participation rates. There are 27 countries around the world that have mandatory voting, including Australia. Australia, Belgium, um, Luxembourg, and Greece, a lot of countries in South America, and it's, uh, it, it is a very 
uh, aggressive form of forcing people to vote. So they essentially will fine you a monetary fine or they will lock you out for you won't be able to use public goods and services. So you won't be able to get a job in government, for example. Um, I do understand that this flies in the face of the First Amendment and the right to choose in the United States, but it's nevertheless an interesting thing worth considering um, if you want to get voter participation, particularly by low income and minority groups who tend not to vote. And I will just say that the uh, participation rates in those countries tends to be over 90%. We might even hold it over a couple of days, one of them a weekend day. Th there's a, there's are other things you can do. The other thing that's considered in many European countries is that you provide subsidies to um, low income workers who rely on uh, on, uh, on on hourly wages, so on the day of the vote, you actually fund them so that they don't have to worry about their compensation on that day. Mm -hmm. So there, there are lots of other things that we could definitely think about. You also, uh, you know, to hark back to my question about the three branches of going at the beginning, you really uh, believe strongly in restoring civics classes and an awareness of government. Absolutely. Um, you know, as a, an immigrant to this country, I'm required to take a test. Um, any immigrant coming to this country who wants to get a passport, it doesn't matter, regardless of background, income, education, you must take a test. Um, and I, I found it quite disheartening that civics is not mandatory um, for in many places. I, I was just in Seattle yesterday, and a civics teacher had come to my presentation with his students, and he said, well, in this state, it's mandatory, but in many states in this country, it's not. Um, and yet, uh, it, it, it's about how we, we engage with government. How, what are the voters' rights? What are our responsibilities? Um, by the way, I might just add also, in a capitalist society, the other subject I think should be mandatory is uh, financial skills. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know why they teach us how to, you know, carpentry and how to build a chair. I mean, <laughs> frankly, I'm never going to do that. But financial skills, being able to open a bank account, manage your, your own affairs, I think is something that uh, is surprisingly missing given the, um, the importance of the economy and, and finance in this country. Yes, and we're such a consumer-led economy yeah. that a well-behaved consumer should be almost a civic virtue. You That's know? correct, yeah. yeah. Um, and then continuing along inside the voting, you um, posit that perhaps there should be weighted voting with a, a skills test or a knowledge test and so, people can pass yeah. that and be awarded a greater share or weight to their vote. So that's a more virulent version of uh, what I was uh, proposing initially. Um, I'll come to that in a second. But the, the, the basic idea about a weighted vote is that you um, allocate higher or lower weights to people who are more engaged, um, who actually do know uh, what the three branches of government are. Um, it's essentially a way to encourage people to be more participatory. Mm. Um, and, and you know, I, I, as I said, you can design it and devise it, hopefully, in a way that is non-discriminatory. And the civics test that I, I uh, mentioned earlier for immigrants to this country, I think, is potentially one one way. Um, I talk a little bit about implementation pitfalls. We do. We're not talking about, or I'm not talking about um, uh, any form of test that will discriminate based on adjectives. So this is not about race or gender or land ownership or any of that stuff. I think those are blatantly unacceptable. But I think there are ways for us to enhance the uh, voter engagement so that people are not voting for reasons that are, are trivial. Um, just to pick up on your point about this extreme version, um, which has been considered in places in Canada and Switzerland, is about ascribing higher weights um, to people based on certain areas. So for example, doctors, nurses, um, I, I think this is true. They have more information about where the, what the best uh, use of a marginal dollar is. Should it be for x-rays? Should it be for medicine? Should it be for beds? I mean, frankly, I don't know. But because they work in that area, um, they should have a higher weight for issues that come on the ballot regarding health care. Um, I can see how that might be appealing in, um, in a referenda, for example. Um, but um, obviously, for general elections, I think it would be much harder to implement you know, it's a, a weighted vote. It's a at first pass, it might seem controversial, but then you consider with gerrymandering and with money as a form of speech and with the structure of politics in this country right now where you good people in California have about a third as much clout as someone in Wyoming in your votes. We already have weighted voting 
Well, you have we just crept into it in kind of a bad way. Yeah, and I think p maybe people aren't really aware. I mean, you also have mandatory, excuse me, you have uh, weighted voting in the Democratic Party. Super delegates get bigger weights than mm -hmm. uh, average delegates. So but it's not like it's an exotic idea. Well, it's and it's better not. Better administered. So during Brexit, I'll just throw this one out as well, um, there was a discussion as to whether they should, should actually ascribe higher weights to young people because they were going to suffer the consequences or enjoy the benefits of Brexit longer. Um, mm -hmm. I... Frankly, because I'm on the older side, I actually preferred the other argument, which is that older people should have a bigger weight because they had more knowledge and understanding of how the economy works. And so, but you know, again, these are fodder for discussion. Um, you know, as we think about evolving the the electoral process. As we run to the end of our time, I'd like to turn back to the questions from the audience. What role should community-based and civil society organizations play in increasing the strength and participation in democracy? Uh, I think absolutely huge, uh, and you know nowhere near enough. Uh, obviously, because of this uh, skew in terms of uh, a lack of participation in, in the voting uh, arena, I, I actually have spent quite a bit of time with a woman who is based in Chicago, who runs the largest um, uh, union for. Uh, house workers, so people who essentially uh, you know, largely clean uh, clean people's homes, but also take care of you know elderly parents, young children, etc. And um, one of the things that she said, um, which to me is quite disturbing, is that she, they did a, a sort of kitchen table sort of poll with the organization, and they said something like 97% of the people there um, had said that they would vote Democratic. Um, and then they said, well, how many of you are actually going to vote? And it was less than 2%. And I right. thought, gosh, you know, that's, uh, those types of, of, uh, of that type of contribution um, would be quite meaning meaningful. And so I think civil society um, can do a whole host of things, you know, and it's, I think some of those things are being done already. They transport, you know, indigent people to the polls. But I think that that might be more on the margin um, where I think the, the real uh, payoffs um, could be would be to really try and get government to think more long term, um, maybe lobby for for longer term um, uh, sort of thinking in, in the government by extending terms and some mm -hmm. of the other proposals I have in the book. Uh, to head to the other end of the telescope, have the IMF and the World Bank been a driving force for either growth or democratization in your eyes? Well, they have, meaning that they have been very explicit about it. Washington consensus in the uh, late 90s was absolutely about um, uh, essentially sp the spread of democracy and the spread of market capitalism. Um, I think that the rise of China has a little bit scuppered their, their plans, but um, I think that that was very explicit. There was no um, ambiguity about their belief that um, not only was democracy important, but it was a prerequisite for growth and also the uh, importance of market capitalism. Um, and so I think that that's you know, essentially been their role. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, I should point out, I think that's why they're struggling a little bit now because um, they, they are trying to broaden their purview to accommodate other countries like China that haven't followed that path, um, but nevertheless obviously have had tremendous success moving over 300 million people out of poverty. Um, but, you know, let's just remember that in the 1800s, China was the largest economy in GDP terms. Um, they made some big mistakes in terms of short-term thinking, and it cost them sort of 300 years of economic success. So we don't want to see that in the United States and, and certainly not in other places in the world. There is a question here regarding the rise of complacency in American culture, citing uh, Tyler Cowen. You may know this thesis. Okay. Is this a real phenomenon? How big of a problem is it? And is it possible to revive a culture of risk taking against complacency before we reach a crisis point? Oh, I, I hope so. Um, I think that there, I, I, first of all, I think that, that uh, I know Tyler a little bit. I think um, to me, that's much more of a behavioral, maybe sociological question as opposed to an economic question. I mean, I think the risk aspect, yes, that kind of falls into more economics, but maybe the motivations for risk taking um, are, are, are probably a little bit outside my, my area. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, I, I do uh, think that uh, risk taking is critically important for economic success. Um, there's a, a, another fantastic book um, by William Thorndike, uh, who talks, it's called The Outsiders, and he talks about companies that outperform uh, their peers and outperform the benchmark over long periods of time. And his one uh, argument is that those companies focus on capital allocation, um, and so essentially are taking sort of good bets, good risks. Um, you know, and so I think that that's something that I hope 
um, will always remain part of the American zeitgeist. It is absolutely part of Americana. And, it and that does cycle back to what we were saying earlier that, um, I mean, good risk taking does involve being able to posit the future in a fairly dependable way. Yeah. And if you are highly indebted, if you are at risk of a catastrophe, if your health is bad, if you um, worry about the cost of educating your children, it's harder to take risk. Yeah. So it is or, part of the problem. And also if you don't know what the lay of the land is going to be. I mean, right now, uh, I spend a lot of time in Britain. The biggest concern they have right now is nobody wants to invest. Uh, the property prices are going down very reasonably because people are saying, well, wait a second, I have no idea what the timeline of this, of this Brexit thing is, nor do I know what the policy is going to look like. So I might as well sit on my hands and wait and see. Um, I, you know, for, for what it's worth, I think I hope that um, Britain gets it right. But I was there last week and the it was astonishing it was sort of something 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 October yeah. you know <laughs> that what was seemed to be the plan and then we're gonna figure it out my goodness it's been 700 days mm -hmm. you know. yeah lots of moving parts there yeah. um, so this will be our last question from the audience what do you view as the most viable changes in the current US political system that would bring about positive change in social equality and faith in democracy obviously buy the book and you'll yeah. read a couple of them but um, so I guess another way of thinking about that is what's the highest bang for buck um, of the proposals? There you go. Is that a, is that a good way of summarizing? Sure. Um, uh, for me, uh, and, I, and I don't mean this in any sort of crass way, I think Americans um, understand the value of a dollar. Um, and so I think if we can somehow get politicians um, to uh, be judged, uh, and, and essentially the compensation thing to me, I think is the one that's most easily transferable into people's minds. We understand the value of money. We, we, we sort of um, understand its importance in the capitalist society. We've already experienced as private sector participants changes in our compensation. So of, of them all, I think that that was a sort of low hanging fruit to get politicians to really focus on, on long term outcomes. Good. Well, there you go. It's not even the end of the program yet. <laughs> but I, uh, I did want to say before we finish, I very much admire your, how clear-eyed you are about a, a very severe problem, but refuse to capitulate to despair yourself, to see that there is an optimism and an ability to revive in this. And that is such an important message. Yeah. Well, yeah. listen, I have to tell you, um, I was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, born in, in Zambia. At the time of my birth, they didn't give birth certificates to, to blacks. Um, it only changed in 1973. And uh, I, I constantly pinch myself, because I'm here I am, um, sitting in California, having a conversation about um, things mm -hmm. that are kind of, you know, percolating in my brain. Um, and so I figure in less than 50 years, the world can change so that a, a girl born in a, a poor landlocked country um, with 10 million people can actually be, it's possible for me to be here in what I consider the greatest country in the world. Um, and so why should I not remain optimistic about the fate of, of possible? Gratitude is such an underutilized stance. Costs nothing and repays massively. Well, thank you. <laughs> Our thanks to Dambisa Moyo, international economist and author of the new book, Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It. Dr. Moyo will be signing books outside the room in just a minute, so make sure to pick up a copy as you leave. I'm Quentin Hardy, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you.